Hello and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The following disclaimer applies for tonight's broadcast. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are only the opinions of the participants and do not reflect any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Please keep your comments open to the public and on the level for tonight's show. So, as usual, you can interact with us from the comfort of your own homes, lodges, wherever you're watching, by um, sending us a message on the right side of the YouTube stream or in the Facebook live stream. So we're looking forward to all of your awesome comments and commentary as we have this exciting show that we're we're bringing. To, uh, for you tonight. So you all know me. My name is Jason Richards. I'm past master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia. Also a member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in Washington, D.C. John is out tonight. He is off doing undisclosed things at an undisclosed location. Anyway, we'll move it over to Mike the intern for his introductions. Hello, Mike Hambrick here. Uh, junior warden and lodge education officer for Lakeshore Lodge number 307 in Madison, Ohio. Good evening, everyone. All right. Good evening. Thanks so much for being with us, Mike. On to the one, the only Juan Sepulveda. Hello, everyone. Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast. Thanks for being yeah. here. All right, thanks, Juan. And last but certainly not least, Brother Robert Johnson. Hello, everybody. Uh, Robert Johnson here, a past master at Waukegan Lodge number 78 in Waukegan, Illinois, current sitting secretary at Space Novum Lodge and uh, host of the Whence Came You Masonic podcast. Thanks for coming out tonight and uh, enjoying this great topic as we talk about the Regis poem. I need, we needed um, the Regis Philbin. <laughs> Yeah, we needed. We should have like we should have had Nick come on to be like, be a Regis Philbin. I posted a meme on the uh, or Facebook, so enjoy that. <laughs> I'm not a manuscript. <laughs> so yeah, everybody, um, this is technically uh, six years of us being together on the Masonic Roundtable with you watching with us, and that's that's awesome. But John's not here tonight. So we can't have a party unless we're all here. So we're moving the sixth year anniversary show to next week uh, when he'll be back in town. And then we can all uh, hang out, reminisce, and, and have a, a really fun, uh, really zany six-year show. So before we get on to tonight's topic, which is the Regius Manuscript, I uh, just want to uh, spend some time and give a special shout out and thank you to our Patreons. Uh, thank you so much for all you do to support the show. We look forward to uh, participating with you. And uh, for for those of you Patreons who are at the Knight and, um, and Squire level, we actually have a specific uh, Facebook group that we interact with all of you on. We all five of us are on there. We, we absolutely love all of the interactions we have. Some really good conversations about what books we're reading and what folks would like to see in future shows and things like that. So if you're interested, go to www.patreon.com, look for the Masonic Roundtable and sign up because we'd love to bring you backstage and, and show you some of the, the cool extras about TMR as well. So that being said, let's get on tonight's topic, which is the Regius Manuscript. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Juan Sepulveda uh, for an introduction to the topic. Juan. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so I'm going to pronounce it differently just because I can. <laughs> I call it the Regius Manuscript, and I could be wrong, but uh, the Regius Manuscript, uh, it's also known as the Halliwell Manuscript. And what is it? I, I We briefly mentioned it in our uh, one of our recent episodes, but it is a poem of 794 verses, and it details some of the duties and obligations of the stone cutters and mason uh, mason layers um, of the craft. And it is very unique because it's written in it is written as a poem, and it's a very interesting way to position something uh, of this of this nature. Normally, you have very monotonous, uh, very technical kind of uh, 
yeah, technical jargon used. And here we have this the elegance of the of the prose that's utilized. And another reason why it's such an important document for for us is because it gives us a glimpse at what was happening in those early years where there was that transition from the operative to the speculative. And some of the estimates of its age dated back to the first quarter of the 15th century. So, I mean, yeah, the 15th century. So that is, uh, that is significant considering that they either had a DeLorean because masonry started in 1717, obviously, but we'll let it slip. Ish. 1717-ish. Yeah. yeah, slash 21. So when it was discovered, it, it, it was kept privately uh, for, uh, for quite some time. It was donated by King George II in 1757 to the British Museum. And there it stayed in obscurity until it was first published in 1840. So you could imagine the 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 noise it made when it was finally published, and we started getting a publicly a, a glimpse into that early beginnings of of masonry. So tonight we're going to dig into the the Regis poem or the what's the other name the Halliwell manuscript, and we're gonna tackle this together. We're gonna read through some of it, and we're gonna find some interesting stuff together. If you've never read it before. You're up for a treat because there's a lot of things you will recognize in it. So, yeah, this is this is the uh, not quite audible version of, uh, <laughs> of the Regis manuscript or the, the Regis poem. So we'll go ahead. Hammy, I think uh, I think you've got the first bit. So we'll go ahead and dig right in. We're going to read through the entire thing and then we'll dissect it, take it apart. So take us away, Mike. Okay. Uh, here begin the constitutions of the art of geometry according to Euclid. Anyone who will look can find written in old books the story of great lords and ladies. They had many children, but no income to support them. Whether in town or field or woods, they took counsel together to plan for their children. How they could best live their lives without much discomfort care and strife, and mostly for the coming multitude of their children for their success. They sent to great scholars to teach them good works. They asked them for our Lord's sake to give their children work so they could earn a living both well and honestly and with security. At that time, through geometry, this honest craft of masonry was established in this way. Created by these scholars at these Lord's requests, they created geometry and they gave it the name of masonry. For the most respected craftsmen of all, these Lord's children came to learn the craft of geometry from him, which he did very skillfully because of their father's prayers and the mother's too. He set them to learning his this honest craft, whoever learned best and was honest and was more skillful than his fellows. If in it that he came upon uh, that it came that he came upon him, he could have more honor than the less skillful. This great scholar was scholar's name was Euclid. His fame spread far and wide. This great scholar ordered that whoever was a better worker should teach even the slowest learner. To become perfect in the respectable craft, so each one should teach the other and love one another like sister and brother. Furthermore, he ordered that he should be called master so that he would be most honored. He should be called that but Masons should never call one another among themselves within the craft. Subject or servant, my dear brother, although one is not as skillful as another, everyone should call each other fellows in friendship because they are all were born to ladies. In this way, 
through knowledge of geometry, the craft of masonry began. The scholar Euclid founded in this way, the craft of geometry in Egypt. In Egypt, he taught it widely throughout the land, everywhere. It was many years later, I understand, before the craft came into this land. The craft came into England, I tell you, in good King Athelstan's time. He had halls and dwellings built and tall churches greatly esteemed. But to spend time in both day and night and to worship his God with all his might, this good Lord greatly loved this craft and intended to strengthen it in every part. Because he found many faults in the craft, he sent throughout the land for all masons of the craft to come to him straight away to correct all these faults by good advice. He called an assembly then of many lords, dukes, earls, and barons too, knights, squires, and many more, and the chief officials of the city, they were all there in their stations. Each one was there to make regulations for the Masons. They sought by their understanding how to govern them. They established 15 articles and 15 points. 15 articles they made there and 15 points there they made. Here begins the first article. The first article of this geometry, the master mason must certainly be steadfast, trustworthy, and true. Then he will never have regrets. Pay your workmen what is just so they can afford food and pay them what they have earned what they may deserve, and do not hire more workmen than are necessary for the job. Do not play favorites from friendship for, or fear, and not take bribes from anyone, neither from lord nor workman, nor take improper fees from them. As a judge, you might be upright and do justice to everyone. Do this wherever you go, and then your honor and profits will be the greatest. Second article. The second article of good masonry, as you must hear now, is that every master who is a mason must be at the general congregation if he receives reasonable notice of where the assembly shall be held. He must attend that assembly unless he has a reasonable excuse or else he is disobedient to the craft or if he has overtaken with falsehood or is he, he is so sick that he cannot come that is a good excuse not to come to the assembly. Third article. The third article is this, that the master will not take an apprentice unless he will promise to take him for seven years, as I tell you, to learn the craft thoroughly. With less time, he may not be able to work the employer's profit or to his own, as you might have good reason to know. Fourth article. The fourth article is this, the master will see to it that he does not make a bondman his apprentice or take him on as one out of greed because the Lord that he is bound to might come to take the apprentice from wherever he is. If he were taken in the lodge, it might cause great upset. And it could happen that it would enrage some or all the workmen. For all the masons that are there will stand together if such a bondman had been living among them and it would be it would cause much discontent to maintain the peace then take an apprentice of higher social rank by old writings i find that the apprentice should be of good family and at one time those great lords blood learned this geometry the fifth article the fifth article is very good, that the apprentice must be of lawful blood. The master shall not, for any reason, make one an apprentice who is deformed. It is necessary, as you know, that all of his limbs are whole. It would be a great shame on the craft to make a lame or limping man an apprentice, because such an imperfect man would be of little good to the craft. Everyone must know this. The craft should have a sound worker. A crippled man cannot work well. This will be obvious right away. 
Sixth article. You must not overlook the sixth article, that the master should not harm his employer by taking from the employer for his apprentice as much pay as his fellows are paid, who are fully skilled when he is not. You must see that it is not reasonable for him to be paid as much as his fellows. The same article, in such a case, states that the apprentice shall take less than his fellows who are fully trained, in many respects, properly. The master may inform his apprentice that his wages may increase soon, and before his apprenticeship ends, he may receive a raise. Seventh article. The seventh article, now, will tell all of you that no master, for profit or from fear, shall clothe or feed a thief. He shall never harbor a thief, nor someone who has killed a man, nor someone of bad reputation, so that the craft is not shamed. <clears throat> eighth article. The eighth article tells you what the master may do if he has any workman who is not as capable as he should be. He may replace him, and in his place hire a more able man. Such a man, through carelessness, might bring discredit on the craft. Ninth article. The ninth article shows that the master should be both wise and able, that he should not take on any work unless he can complete it properly, to the employer's profit and to the craft's credit, and that the foundation should be well made so that it is not flawed or cracked. Tenth article. The tenth article is to know that among the craft, from the highest to the lowest, no master shall supplant another, but should teach each other like brother and sister. In this skillful craft, in anything that belongs to a master mason, nor should he supplant any other man who has taken on a job, under a severe penalty of no less than ten pounds, if he is found guilty of taking, or of no less than ten pounds. If he is found guilty of taking work from the one who had it first, for no man in masonry shall supplant another, unless the work is done so badly that it is coming to nothing. In that case, a mason may take on the job in order to save it for the employer. In such a case, if it fails, no mason should get involved. Truly, whoever lays the foundation, if he is a competent mason, has it firmly in his mind to bring the work to a proper completion." Eleventh article. The eleventh article, I tell you, is that he should be both fair and free, for it teaches that no mason should work at night unless in the pursuit of knowledge, which shall be for suffi a sufficient reason. Twelfth article. The twelfth article is to be honest with all masons everywhere. He should not speak ill of his fellow's work if he wants to remain honest. He should commend it with honest words, with the understanding God gave, and assist him to improve it in any way that you can, between the two of you, without doubt. Thirteenth article. The thirteenth article, so help me God, is that if a master have an apprentice, he will teach him properly so that he may improve and ably know the craft wherever he may go. Fourteenth article. The fourteenth article shows the master what he should do. He should not take an apprentice unless he takes care within the term of the apprenticeship he may learn the full knowledge of the craft. Fifteenth article. The fifteenth article is the last, for he has become the friend to the master, to teach him that not for anyone will he tell a lie, nor support his fellows in wrongdoing, for any profit, nor commit perjury, for the sake of his soul, so that he does not bring shame to the craft and blame to himself. The Plural Constitutions At this assembly, points were also ordered by the lo great lords and the masters. First point, anyone who wants to know this craft must love God and the Holy Church, and also the master that he is with, wherever he goes, in fields or woods, and love his fellows too, because that is what being in the craft requires. Second point. The second point I will tell you is that the mason must labor on the work days as well as he can so, he, so that he deserves to take a holiday and to do labor well so that he earns his pay. Third point. The third point is one that the apprentice should know well to keep his master's words confidential and also his fellow's words to tell no one what is said in private 
nor what takes place in the lodge, whatever you hear or see them do. Do not tell to anyone anywhere. Whether told to you in the hall or apartment, keep it secret to your great honor, so you don't bring blame upon yourself and shame to the craft. Fourth point. The fourth point teaches us that no one should be false to the craft. He should not complain against the craft, but let it go. Nor should he do anything prejudicial against his master or his fellow. And even though one is an apprentice, he would be under the same law. Fifth point. The fifth point is that when a mason receives his pay from the master, he should take it without complaint, and the master must give him proper notice before noon if he will not employ him, him any longer. As he had been doing, he should not disobey this order if he expects to prosper. Sixth point. <clears throat> the sixth point should be known both by the highest and the lowest. If it happens that among masons, through envy or hate, a conflict comes up, then the mason, if he can, should have the matter put aside and try not to, to settle the dispute yet until the workday is completely done. They should wait until a holiday to take time to settle their dispute so that the workday would not be interrupted by their argument. This should be done so they stand well before God. Seventh point. The seventh point is, so that God will grant us long life, and is well known, you should not sleep with your master's wife, nor with your fellows, so that the craft will not despise you, nor with your fellow's girlfriend, any more than you would want him to sleep with yours. Let the penalty be sure, even though he is an apprentice for a full seven years, if he violates any of them, he must be punished severely, as an example for such a foul, deadly sin. Eighth point. The eighth point, the eighth point, if you have learned anything from your master, be true, for you will never regret it. You must be an honest mediator for your master and your fellows. Everything you do, do honestly to both parties. The ninth point. The ninth point is this, that if you are acting as a steward, when you're eating together, serve one another cheerfully. Good fellows, you must know that everyone should be a steward in turn, week after week, taking turns to be stewards, good-naturedly serving each other as though you were sister and brother. No one shall neglect to pay his share, owing his payment, but everyone shall share equally in the cost. See that you always pay properly. If you have brought any food to eat, so no one has to ask you for payment, nor has to ask any of your companions. To man or woman, whoever it may be, pay for it promptly and correctly. If you are a steward, give an accurate accounting for the payment you made, so you don't embarrass your fellow and bring blame upon yourself. Keep good records of the food and drink, of what you spent for your fellows, where and how and why. You must provide such accounting when your fellows ask it of you. Tenth point. <clears throat> the tenth point presents a good life to live without care and strife, because if a mason lives wrongly and makes mistakes in his work and makes up a false excuse and blames his fellows without reasons and through such slander brings blame upon the, blame upon the craft, if he does such wrong to the craft, then you shall no longer help him nor support him in his wicked life, so it does not turn to discord and conflict. Rather, without delay, you shall make him appear whenever you want, anywhere you please, to call him to the next assembly to appear before all his fellows. And unless he will appear before them, he must leave the craft. He shall then be punished by the law that was laid down long ago. Eleventh point. The eleventh point is about good discretion. As you must know, if a mason knows his craft well and sees a fellow working on a stone and he sees is about to spoil that stone, help fix it if you can and teach him how to do it better so that the employer's work is not spoiled. Teach him tactfully how to fix it with well-chosen words what God gives you for the, sake, for the sake of God above and encourage him with kind words. Twelfth point. The twelfth point is of high importance. When the assembly is held, 
masters and fellows shall be there, and many other great lords. The sheriff of the county shall be there, and also the mayor of the city. Knights and squires shall be there, not just patreons, and also aldermen, as you shall see. Whatever ordinances they make there, they shall enforce against anyone, whoever it may be, who belongs to the craft, if he violates any of them, will be taken into custody. Thirteenth point. The thirteenth point is that he shall never swear to be a thief, or he shall swear never to be a thief, nor to help one in his crime, for it is not good to rob, and you must know that it is a sin, neither for his sake nor his family's. Fourteenth point. The fourteenth point is a good law for one who must who should be apprenticed. He must swear a good true oath to his master and fellows. He must be steadfast and true to all these ordinances wherever he goes, to his liege and to his liege lord the king, to be true to him above all and to the preceding points. You must be sworn and everyone shall swear the same oath among the masons, whether they want it or not to all the preceding points that have been laid down by tra tradition. And they shall examine any man about any charges against him. And if he is found guilty of violating any of these points, whoever he may be, let him be sought out and brought before this assembly. They mean business. They're not playing <laughs> before the assembly. All right. Give me a second here. I covered my document. Here we go. 15 points. The 15 point is good. That for those who have been sworn there, such ordinances were laid down by the assembly, by great lords and masters, as stated before. If anyone violates these ordinances that have been made, these articles that were enacted by great lords and masons together, and if it is proven openly that they did so, before the assembly and they do not make amends for their guilt then they must leave the craft and refuse any offer of work as a mason and swear never again to work at it but unless they subsequently make amends they should never return to the craft and if they will not agree to do so the sheriff shall come and put them in deep prison for the wrong that they have done and take their goods and their cattle into the king's hand all of it and let them re remain there until the king wishes to release them. Another ordinances of the art of geometry. They order that an assembly should be held every year, wherever they wanted, to correct the faults if any were found among the craft. Every year, or third year, it should be held in whatever place they choose. Notice of the time and place must be given, and where they should assemble. All the members of the craft must be there and other great lords to correct the faults that are found. If any rules have been broken, they shall all swear whoever belongs to the craft to keep all the statutes that were ordered by King Athelstan. These statutes that I have set out here, I order that they be followed thoroughly my, my land no, throughout my land, for the honor of my loyalty that I have ordered by my rank. End quote. That was a quote. Good grief. <laughs> I'm used to only reading Dr. Seuss. I apologize. Athelstan okay. was long-winded. Yeah. Also, at, very at every assembly that you hold, that you come to your liege king, asking him by his favor to stand by you everywhere, to confirm the statutes of King Athelstan that he ordered for his craft. Number seven, the art of the four crowned ones. Pray we now to Almighty God and to his mother, Mary Bright, that we may keep these articles and also the points, as those four holy martyrs did, who were greatly honored in this craft. They were as good masons as there are stone carvers and makers of statues of statues for they were among the best workmen the emperor greatly admired them and ordered them to make an image that might be worshiped for him he had such idols in his day to turn the people away from christ's law but they were steadfast i apologize what happened here 
there we go. But they were steadfast in Christ's law as well as to their craft. They loved God and all his teachings and were always in his service. They were true men at all times and followed God's law well. They would not make any idols, not at any price. To believe in an idol instead of their God, they would not do, even if he was furious, for they would not forsake their true faith and believe in his false law. The emperor soon arrested them and put them in deep prison. The harder, the, the, the harder he punished them there, the more joy they had of Christ's grace. Then, when he saw no other way, he condemned them to death. By the book it shows, in the legends of the holy ones, the names of the Quator Coronatum, their feast day will be, without doubt, the eighth day after Halloween. You may hear as I read that after many years, when Noah's flood has gone, the Tower of Babel was begun, as plain a work of stone and cement as any has ever seen. So long and wide it was begun, seven miles high blocking out the sun. King Nebuchadnezzar ordered it made of great strength for man's sake. So if there should be another flood, the water would not cover this building because they were very proud and boastful. However, all that work was lost. An angel struck them with many languages so that none of them knew what the others were saying. Can you understand the words that are coming? Out of my mouth. Many years later, the good scholar Euclid taught the craft of geometry everywhere, as he had done before, and many other crafts. Through the grace of Christ in heaven, he began to teach the seven sciences. Grammar is the first science I know. Logic, the second, as I have bliss. Rhetoric, doubtless, the third. Music is the fourth, I tell you. Astronomy is the fifth, I swear. Arithmetic, the sixth, without doubt. Geometry, the seventh, is the last, for it is both meek and courteous. Grammar truly is the root for whoever wants to learn in books, but logic sur surpasses it in its degree, as the fruit surpasses the root of the tree. Rhetoric measures with ornate speech, and music is a sweet song. Astronomy calculates, my dear brother, Arithmetic shows how one thing equals another. Geometry is the seventh science that can separate falsehood from truth. These are the seven sciences. <clears throat> Whoever uses them may well have heaven. Now, dear children, by your wisdom, leave pride and greed and use good judgment and nurture all good things. I ask that you pay attention because you need to know this, but there is much more you need to know then you will find written here and read by Robert Johnson. All right. So get ready because it's, it's time for me to tell you how to go to church. If you're lacking understanding, I pray that God will send it to you. For Christ himself teaches that the Holy Church is God's house that is made for nothing else but to pray in, as the Bible tells us. There the people shall gather to pray and repent for their sins. See that you don't come to church late, because you're gossiping outside. Then when you come to church, always keep in mind to worship the Lord God day and night with all your mind and strength. When you come to the church door, take some holy water, because every drop of it will clean away a venial sin. But first you must take off your hat. For the love of him who died on the cross. When you go into the church, raise your heart up to Christ right away. Look up at the crucifix and kneel down on your knees, then pray to him to work here, according to the law of holy church, to keep the Ten Commandments that God gave to all men. Pray to him with a mild voice to keep you from the seven deadly sins, so that you may here in this life keep from care and strife, Furthermore, that he grant you grace to have a place in heaven's bliss. In holy church, leave behind idle talk, lewd speech and foul jokes, and put away all vanity. And say your Pastor Noster and your Ave Maria. 
Also, don't make noise, but see that you are always in prayer. If you won't pray yourself, at least don't interrupt anyone else. In that place, don't sit or stand, but kneel down, and when the gospel is read, stand up away from the wall and bless the gatherings if you can. When the Gloria Tibi has started and when the gospel reading is done, you should kneel down again on both knees for the love of him who redeemed us. And when you hear the bell ring for the holy sacrament, everyone must kneel, young and old, and hold your hands up. And say in this manner, softly and without making noise, Lord Jesus, you are welcome in the form of bread as I see you. Now, Jesus, by your holy name, shield me from sin and shame. Grant me both forgiveness and the Eucharist. Before I leave here and repentance for my sins, so that I never, Lord, die in it. And as you were born a virgin, never let me be lost. But when I shall leave this place, grant me bliss without end. Amen, amen, so mote it be. Now, sweet lady, pray for me. You might say this, or something like it, when you kneel for the sacrament. Do not fail to want goodness, to worship him who created all things, for a man may be glad in that day, that he sees him once in the day. It is worth so much without doubt. No one can tell how much, but that sight does so much good. That St. Augustine correctly says, that the day you see God's body, you shall surely have as much food and drink as you need, and shall lack nothing on that day, both swearing and idle words. God will also forgive you. If you die suddenly that same day, you do not need to be afraid. Also on that day, I promise you, you shall not lose your eyesight, and every step you take to see that holy sight, they shall be told to stand in good stead for you when you have great need. The messenger, the angel Gabriel, will keep them for you, very well for you. From this matter I will pass on to tell you more benefits of the Mass. Come to church if you can, and hear the Mass every day. If you can't come to church because you have to be at work, when you hear the bell ringing for Mass, pray to God with a still heart to give you part of the service. That is being done in the church. Furthermore, I will tell you to teach to your fellows, when you come before a Lord in a hall of living quarters or at meals, take off your hood or hat before you come up to him. Two or three times you must bow to that Lord with your right knee. That way you will keep your own honor, keep your hat or hood off until he gives you permission to put it on. The entire time you are speaking with him, hold up your chin in a friendly manner. As the book says, look him kindly in the face, keep your hands and feet still, don't move them around awkwardly. Also, don't spit or sniffle. If you have to, do it privately. If you are wise and discreet, you need to conduct yourself well. When you go into the hall, amongst the good and courteous, well-bred folk, don't presume to act too high about your own ancestry or your intelligence. Don't sit or lean on anything that is good manners. Don't look sad. Good manners will save you. Whoever your father and mother are, their child may do well in a hall or living quarters, wherever you may go. Good manners makes a man. To those or higher social standing, do them proper honor, but don't honor them all in turn unless you know who they are. When you are sitting down to a meal, eat in a proper manner. First, be sure that your hands are clean and that your knife is sharp. Cut your bread and meat so it may be eaten if you are sitting by someone of higher rank than you yourself are, let him touch the food first before you reach for it. Don't go for the best piece of food, even if you would really like it. Keep your hands from getting the napkin dirty. Don't blow your nose on it, and don't pick at food caught in your teeth. Don't drink too heavily, even if you really want to, so that your eyes don't water. That would be poor manners. See that there is no food in your mouth when you begin to drink or speak. When you see anyone drinking who is listening to you talk, don't talk too long, whether he is drinking wine or ale. Also, don't show contempt for anyone of, what, of whatever social class he is, and don't speak ill of anyone. If you want to save your own reputation because such talk might become known 
and could make you appear to be in the wrong. Close your hand in your fist. And don't say, quote unquote, if I had only known. Hold your tongue and don't stare. Don't laugh too loud. And don't use off-color language or tell dirty jokes. Don't make jokes except with your equals. And don't repeat everything that you hear. Don't boast about your own deeds for anything. With good speech, you might get what you want. Without it, you might ruin your chances. When you meet a man of higher rank, don't leave your hat on or hood on. Whether in church or in the marketplace, do him proper honor. If you go with a man of higher rank than yourself, you should let your front shoulder stay behind his back, because that is good manners. When he speaks, remain quiet. When he is done, say what you want. In your speech, you should be discreet. Consider well what you are going to say, and don't interrupt his story. Whether you're drinking wine or ale, may Christ then, out of his high grace, give you the understanding and opportunity to read and know this book, to have heaven for your reward. Amen, amen, so mote it be, so say we all for charity. Yay! And you can find it. There it is. Uh, Good night, everybody. Um, Great show. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That last section sounded so much like George Washington's rules for civility. <laughs> I wonder where he got it. Mm, I don't know. So let's let's go through and and dissect this a, a little bit. Robert, you had a you had a pretty good like hundred thousand foot overview of of all the sections. You wanna you wanna share that real quick? Yeah. So uh, well, I had a a large chunk that was really just my notes on what I was reading. Um, so, but I can go through definitely and. Uh, let me just get back to where we were. Sorry to put you on the spot there. No, it's totally okay. Um, our, uh, let's see here. Let me go back to the top here. Okay. So during uh, Hambrick, when he was reading it, we have a piece that says, So each one should teach the other and love one another like sister and brother. Uh Interesting to note, right? This is where we are, are really talking about some of the uh, tenets in masonry where um, we don't see it a whole lot, in my opinion. Uh, it, the idea that you should be happy and uh, cry with your brothers to really know them and uh, be there to teach them. So that was pretty interesting. You know, hey, Robert, here's something that I thought was, yeah. was really interesting in the sense that it was absent. I didn't, I didn't see anything in this entire poem talking about really the families of Masons, like widows and orphans. It was all about taking care of your brethren with the exception of not porking your brother's wife. <laughs> right. I think right. we just, didn't we just read something about lewd language, um, Jason? I mean, no. I, uh, okay. <laughs> No, yeah, I mean it is really interesting to see the evolution of these, and I think you know we've got some plans in the in the future here for everybody listening and watching uh, to dissect further manuscripts as we kind of go through them. You know, a lot of them are longer than 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 the Regius, um, which is why and, we're not going to read them. Yeah, but <laughs> but some of them have some real departures, and um, what is really interesting about all of this is. Um, you start to see the injection, like, like at the end of this particular manuscript, it's really about, uh, like how to be devotional and how to connect. And in those days, I mean, this is really like the way you would do it, right? It's this huge emphasis on prayer. Um, my favorite line in the whole thing, I noticed Juan, Juan highlighted it too, is my favorite, you know, the manners makes the man. Um, but it, it's really interesting. So we see that the church element, right. And then as is, uh, we evolve the, the element of family or the church family kind of comes back into it. And so I wonder if that's where it comes in later. You have that part, uh, of manners making the man in, 
of course it uh it reminds me both of the Kingsman movie. Yes. And, yes. And of, <laughs> That's what I was just brotherhood. looking up. I've never yeah. seen the Kingsman, you guys. Oh, bro, you it's fun. maketh man. Yeah, it's fun. Watch the first one. That you don't worry about the second one for a while. All right. Uh, okay. but, but one thing that was interesting to me is it, it makes the emphasis of being selective and the man who you allow to be part of the craft and how it, it's it prescribes the quality of man that we should associate with and and i thought that that's very interesting because of course as our membership declines you see the relaxation of some of those expectations and i think it will be to the detriment of the craft in future generations of it and you know some people hear this and they pucker up and and, and say, well, you guys are being elitist. What's, well, what's the, what's it say in here? What what's it say there? To maintain the peace, then take an yeah. apprentice of higher social rank. Mm. So, and that is yeah, the apprentice. Right. So, the lowest rung in 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 this organization would be someone of of higher education and higher higher social status. Well, and, until they until they graduate from their apprenticeship and become a fellow, right? Yeah, but they can't still. But the other people status. coming in, right, 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 yeah, yeah, are already at a higher Another's... level. And I like that though. But the whole point about the bondman, though, because that that explains that whole freeborn part. You know, tell me, tell tell me more about that because yeah, I was a little, a little confused more. by the wording. Okay, a bondman is a guy, basically, it's like even even in what we know as apprentices, like in, you know, Franklin's era, they signed an agreement that they are um, beholden to that person for that length of time. They are not free. They have no freedom of choices of anything. And it's the same kind of thing, only we're actually talking more back in feudalism. So you've made an agreement to live in this guy's um, serfdom really and serve him now by serving him if you leave before you've actually paid your dues as you know providing enough uh, crop or whatever it is you signed on to do you are you he owns you I mean it's not slavery but it's basically you can't leave at all until you're paid up so. Super interesting. <laughs> now you could be born to that too, though, and still be stuck there. That's the that adds the next phase with free born. That's fair. Yeah. One, what we're oh, end up, you know, passing on through through later generations, if the debt is not paid in full. So, Juan, what were some of the the bigger themes that, that you pulled out of what you were reading? In a minute, <laughs> we'll come back to you. <laughs> um, some of the some of the things that uh, that I thought were interesting in in my um, section was um, just how how much of this has transferred over to the craft today. You know, we have an emphasis on not speaking evil of our our brethren. That's that's in this manuscript. Um, things like not supplanting our brethren and, and whatever they're trying to do. Like a lot of the, the basic tenets of, of, you know, at least uh, American Freemasonry today are, you can find sprinkled throughout this entire manuscript. So it's, it's fascinating to me how much of it, you know, has, has remained. Yeah. I mean, there's the whole section that says to tell no one what is said in private or, uh, what takes place in the lodge, whatever you hear or see them do, right? To keep inviolable secrets. <laughs> um, we we really do have so much of this just peppered throughout ritual today. I mean, I can't say that masonry of this era is anything like, you know, what we practice today in terms of, you know, really anything. We, the, 
people out there who may be listening, um, there are significant differences, of course, between the speculative art that we practice today and the operative art that a lot of this is is being done. And paint a picture of a cathedral being built and, and outside encampments of workers living on the grounds uh, with their families. Uh, and in that respect, a lot of these laws and whatnot that's, that's happening is uh, communals, uh, communities living together, doing this building with their families there. I mean, you're agreeing not to, you know, sleep with, uh, you know, wives or girlfriends or whatever the case is. Um, and, and not and to steal. Think, yeah, because uh, and then this goes back also, like if we read uh, a lot of Albert Pike's work where he talks about, you know, not taking anything that you're not, um, you know, the creator of or you're just reward for um, there's. Um, significant amounts of degrees uh, in masonry throughout all of the different rites and systems that talk about, uh, you know, this is a guy who's trying to pass off work that's not his, right? And then he gets found out or or whatever the case is. Um, but we see that just kind of really tied into all of the stuff that's in these documents. Uh, the, the church point, I, I have to say the first, it, it really took me a second when I was reading it the first time when it says, if you can't go to church, even though you should go to mass every day, uh, if you can't go and you hear the church bells, you should like stop and take a moment. And it makes me wonder, do we have brothers out there um, of, you know, I mean, mostly in America, right? It's a, it's overwhelmingly Christian. So do we have brothers out there that when they hear church bells, is that like a practice that's still done? Do you guys stop and, and take a moment? Or is that something that's not, not done so much anymore? I thought it was kind of a stoic mo a move. It was mm -hmm. really interesting. Well, perhaps uh, more, know. more reverential than stoic. Go ahead, Juan. Yeah. In, in along those lines right now, we don't have, church bells as at one point we did but you could perhaps have a replacement for that and and think of a symbol or think of of a moment and utilize that as a as a trigger for you to actually take the time to have a moment of solemnity or a moment of reverence and i think we miss that in the hectic nature of our daily life we may be just wrapped up in in, in the busy work and we don't have to actually go out on a mission trip in order to connect with God and have an impact on, on society. Our involvement could be as simple as recognizing that another human being needs your attention and for you to stop and recognize that uh, divine connection you're creating with that individual by just paying attention to them, putting the freaking phone down or, or, or just stopping from, from watching the TV. So, put the damn phone down <laughs> and but think about our, our symbols we always say and and repeat ad nauseum the uh the science of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols well that's the great exponential power of a symbol that contained within that one icon you have the the vast history of its significance and the vast uh, detail of its proper application to life. So whenever you see that you're wearing your ring incorrectly with the points in, take a moment to recognize what do those points mean? Am I actually keeping my passions within due bounds? Actually, listen to me. You're not listening. You're still focused on the incorrect positioning of the, of the ring. I'm saying if you are wearing it with the points in, which is incorrectly and a pagan move, just saying, take a moment to recognize what does it mean? What are the points there for to keep your passions within due bounds and for you to recognize the boundaries of your life? Thank you, Dr. Or, Warren. My pleasure. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's interesting where we're talking a lot about um, there, there, there is, you know, an overt Christian uh, Catholic influence to, to this manuscript. And, and for those of you who haven't studied the history of stonemasonry, that, that 
might be a little confusing, but the, the fact of the matter is uh, stonemasons were heavily employed by the Catholic Church. Um, that the, you know, after, after you got through the Middle Ages, in feudal societies, folks weren't building castles anymore, they were building cathedrals. And so it makes sense to me why we would see just such a heavy Catholic influence on this manuscript because, you know, the, the church was your lifeblood as a stonemason. You know, the entire, like Robert was saying, you know, the stonemason was a community that formed around a building project. And we actually have history of this throughout England and Scotland where you had bands of stonemasons that would move and settle down in a specific area to build a, a Catholic cathedral for, for the Pope and the, and the Catholic Church. So it's just really, really interesting to, to see how, you know, <clears throat> of course, you know, as a, as a stonemason, you're taught not only how to be a good stonemason, but how to be a good Christian. It's, you know, giving, Catholic, giving great customer service to your employer, but also, you know, from a, from a religious aspect of it too. It's, you know, it's really interesting how how you can kind of take that out of out of this manuscript as well. What else have you guys got? I don't know. All right. <laughs> well, I tell you what. It sounds like a uh, it sounds like a natural stopping place for us to go around uh, end the episode with our final thoughts and shameless plugs. We will go ahead and start with wide-eyed Mikey Hambrick. <laughs> I uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading this. I'm actually going to have to read it again myself a few times just to uh, really absorb a lot because there's actually, you know, you're right, that there's so much there that's tied to what, we've are, what we're currently doing in masonry. Uh, but it also feels like, uh, you know, by reading it is a reach back and actually an understanding of, of our historical roots. Um, so that's why I kind of want to really dig into it a little bit myself, even more than we've done here. Uh, so I'm going to be doing that here in the near future, probably write up a nice article about it. So anyway, it was really great. Uh, thanks for, uh, watching the show tonight and, uh, yeah, this was great. All right. Brother Juan Sepulveda. Well, this was an enjoyable episode uh it, it is if this is the first you hear about the regis poem or if you if this is the first time that you hear an extended uh explanation of it i encourage you to still go back and try to read it on your own we read you a modern uh transcription of the regis poem that's why it didn't sound so poetic when we read it but it is a very rich very old uh very archaic English, which is uh, very interesting to to read through, and it's it's definitely worth checking out. The there were many many points that I highlighted. I'm sorry that I didn't have them at the ready when when prompted, but uh, among them that elitism uh, comment, of course, like some people get their aprons in a bunch when we talk about that. But I, I'll pause it. Demand more of yourself. Demand more of the people that surround you and be selective about the people that you spend time with. And you can curate the, you can choose the people you spend time with. And I, I like saying we, we should allow people to join the craft that you wouldn't be concerned inviting over to your house and sitting at the table with your children. And if that's not the case, if you get a bad feeling about an individual, make sure that you do your due diligence and only allow him if worthy and well qualified. That's not an area for us to skimp on, for us to be uh, nonchalant. We need to be very, very cautious about the people that we allowed within our inner circle. And I, I just love these discussions. We can see that back then they were concerned about the importance of being fair, the importance of uh, equality among the brethren and people, you know, members of society, I think is important that the emphasis they put on knowledge that you don't work late, but if you're up late, it is seeking wisdom. And that's a call to action if there ever was one. 
I could say a thousand more things, but the night is, uh, it's time to wrap up. I just want to invite you to go to freemasonryart.com. I just changed my website completely. So if, if you haven't seen some of my artwork, I invite you to go to freemasonryart.com. I have a special promotion going on with my number one piece of work, which is called The Light of Time, my favorite, and it can be your favorite. If you go to freemasonryart.com, free shipping on orders 55 plus. Thank you, brothers. Good night. Awesome. Thanks, Juan. Robert, over to you. All right, over to me. Um, as always, um, these episodes where we go through these historical documents, uh, whenever you go through a historical document, we, we don't do too often on this show, um, you always pick up things new every time. It's like when you watch a degree and you've seen it like for the 500th time, you, you pick up nuances and things that are really interesting. And I think this was no different. Uh, one of my favorite manuscripts that I remember reading uh, in the beginning from a website that I think it's just called the old charges um, or the old manuscripts or something along those lines. Um, I want to say it's called the Alnwick manuscript, but I might be wrong. And it's kind of late. It's like the 18th century. Um, but I read that one and I always talk about it as like, it's this really progressive document. Uh, and it sounds interesting to note that something like Freemasonry would be progressive um, in the time that it was written, but it really seems like it was. And, and you find a lot of that progressive nature um, in these as they evolve. So do yourself a favor and, and read a few of them. A lot of our Grand Lodges, uh, you'll have a Grand Lodge manuscript um, like your Grand Lodge, your bylaws and constitutions, and many of them begin with its own version of the ancient charges or the charges of a Freemason. And it's what's really interesting is they they don't always tie to things that you would think are uh, the most popular. For instance, Illinois has uh, uses ancient charges that are fairly recent, um, 18th century stuff. Um, so do yourself a favor, check out what your state is. It's not as old or as um, dusty of language as you might think it is. Uh, they're kind of rewritten for the time. So uh, many thanks to everybody who stuck with us tonight through our reading um, and the commentary, uh, the great uh, points that people were making on the YouTube comments that I got to see. Um, if you're going to be around in the Chicagoland area tomorrow night, I'll be over at Landmark Lodge number 422 um, in Plainfield, Illinois. I'll be doing a version of an Esoterics 101 presentation with an emphasis on founding organizations. So we'll talk a little bit more about esoteric schools and who started them and that kind of thing as we go through. And then uh, Saturday... Uh, one to three o'clock. If you are already registered, cool. Liberty, Libertyville Lodge 422 is having an esoteric symposium and I'll be doing a newer presentation on the Ark and Freemasonry. So talking about um, the, the legends and what we know, and it's not all Royal Arch, so it'll be fun. I uh, just want to thank everybody out there. And, and one last point, I think I was really trying to find it here uh, when I had posted a, a snip of it in a book called The Master's Lectures. There's actually a uh, published 1923. There's a bit in it, and it says, uh, too many men pass through the West Gate where the light, the fire of education, or education has lit no fires in their eyes, or, or something along those lines. Um, really alluding to the fact that the people we let into masonry really should have a fire of education behind why they're coming in. And, and that education is up for debate, what that exactly is, right? Um, but think about that a little bit. That's it. So thanks so much for, for watching. All right. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, great show tonight, everybody. Thanks so much for, for staying with us. We promise as we go into more and more of these old charges, over the next couple weeks and months that we will not read them all for you. So we figured that uh, this one was was short enough that we could get by with it and uh, you know still have time for a little bit of commentary in the end. So I want to give a special shout out to brother Gar Brothers uh, Art Monk and Gary Meisner on, uh, for the Super Chats tonight on the YouTube chat. Thanks so much for supporting us. 
And thanks so much to everybody watching. We really appreciate you coming and listening to us and watching us week after week. Next week's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do a special six-year anniversary show once we get John back into the fold. And uh, it's, it's going to be a wild couple months. We've got uh, lots of crazy things going on between a uh, Southeast Educational Symposium in Tampa coming up in uh, March. We've got, of course, the uh, Ezekiel Bates Masonic Con in April. Um, we've got, oh goodness, we've got Esotericon 2020 in June. Um, we've also got... Uh, uh, we've got uh, Camp Masonry 2020 coming up in August as well. So it's, it's uh, our calendars are, are looking pretty full. So we hope to see you all at some of those events. We, we love kicking it and hanging out with you guys and just talking about anything and, and nothing all at the same time. So thanks so much for, for spending time with us tonight. Thanks so much for watching and keep searching for more light. Good night.